Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we talk fine dining and American whiskey. In the second half of our show, we'll be joined by Rick Wassman, founder and CEO of Copper Fox Distillery, to talk about his journey and America's along the whiskey trail. Up first, we're pleased to welcome Paul Friedman, professor of history at Yale University and author of 10 Restaurants That Changed America. Paul, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Paul, I see that you're the chair of the History of Science and Medicine program at Yale, and your vitae is pretty heavily laden with work on medieval peasant history. What propelled you to write a book about restaurants? Part of it was I was interested in the images of different classes in society, and food is one of the ways we think about other people. So I wrote a book about spices in the Middle Ages, which is what rich people liked as opposed to peasants. And in working on that, I saw an exhibit of menus at the New York Public Library where I had a fellowship. These menus were modern American menus, but I was fascinated by them. And so spices is kind of the transition to food, and the public library is how I got interested in American food specifically. Let me ask you a question you posed at the beginning of your new book. Is there such a thing as an American cuisine? There is, but if you ask people from other countries, they still think American cuisine means fast food. I wouldn't be that pessimistic. American cuisine is really a composite. Its first component is variety. We are people who, from an early stage, 150 years ago, really, started eating the food of other people, of immigrants, what has been called ethnic cuisine. Mm. A second element is regional food. So Antoine's in New Orleans is my representative of American regional cuisine, the most vibrant or the best surviving example of American regional cuisine, that of Louisiana. The third aspect of American cuisine is what might be called industrial the standardized kind of food that Americans have eaten since really just after the Civil War. This would include canned foods, things like pork and beans or Campbell soups, Nabisco cookies, bread made by industrial bakeries. So this combination is what defines American food rather than particular ingredients like pasta for Italian food. Are there any cultures as omnivorous as Americans when it comes to all the ethnic varieties we eat? The British, who also have a cuisine that doesn't have a very good international reputation, also have had a variety of foods available in their urban areas. Indian food is bigger in Britain, Chinese food bigger in the U.S., but that's the most similar case. What distinguishes a fine dining restaurant from a traditional inn or tavern, which go all the way back to the earliest days of American history? And even beyond that, because you've got to have some place to drink, and you've got to have some food to go with that drink. And similarly, takeout is very old. You have to have some place to eat if you're away from home, if you're at the market or something like that. But a restaurant is different from those taverns, inns, and takeout places in that it is a destination. It's a place you actually intend to go for your entertainment, not just as a necessity. It has a nice atmosphere. Nice can be defined in a number of different ways, from elegant and gracious to noisy and with a buzz. But the atmosphere is part of the appeal. And finally, it's a place that offers more choice than these other alternatives. Choice in the menu of what to order. Choice in the times that they're serving meals rather than just throwing down plates of food at one in the afternoon to everybody who's there. Restaurants offer a range of times that you can show up. And finally, a range of size of tables. You can come in and eat with the people who are your friends or your family, the people you wanted to eat with instead of sitting at a common table. Paul, we can't cover all 10 of the restaurants you write about in your book, but let's hit a few. You write that the leading restaurant in America in the 19th century was Delmonico's in New York City. Paint us a picture. What made Delmonico so special? Well, you have to imagine the scene before Delmonico's, which was pretty rough and ready. Chop houses, the kind of taverns we were just speaking about. Delmonico's, which was established in the early 1830s in New York, offered a gracious atmosphere, elegance, a French 
menu with some American inflection, a kind of international standard of prestige and food that was unlike anything that had been seen in the U.S. What's more remarkable is that it was able to hold that leading ranking, that preeminence throughout the 19th century and into the 20th. It had some rivals, but nobody could quite match the elegance and yet the welcoming atmosphere. Sure, it was exclusive, but you didn't have to belong to one of the top families of New York to get served there. You just had to be able to afford it. You had to have some money, too. And despite its French airs, what distinctly American specialty did Delmonico introduce? Well, they were the inventors of Lobster Newberg, for example, a kind of steak called a Delmonico steak. They were not a steakhouse exactly, but they certainly were among the first restaurants to feature steak, which, oddly enough, had not been considered a delicacy until the late 19th century. Now, the French still can't make a good steak. Oh, I'm not sure I'm going to agree with that. <laughs> Maybe it's the frites that count, but they make a steak that I like, but it's thin. I admit that. Yep. So baked Alaska is a third thing that they invented. It's a dish that was originally called baked Florida Alaska because it's got a cold center of ice cream and a warm exterior of singed meringue. Let's pop down to New Orleans and look at the Antoine's, which you call the oldest grand restaurant in America, still in continuous existence. I've only been there once, preferring the atmosphere at Galatoire's, but there's Certainly something special about dining in the French Quarter. How has Antoine's managed to do it so well for so long? It's an interesting story from a business and public relations point of view. It's a very elegant restaurant and a very large restaurant. It has managed during its 175-year history to appeal to both New Orleans regulars and figures of society in particular, such as Mardi Gras crews but also to tourists. It was so famous in the late 40s and early 50s that a best-selling novel, a mystery story of 1949, was called Dinner at Antoine's. And the author, Francis Parkinson Keyes, didn't have to explain further. Everybody knew where Antoine's was. Even Otter is a Bugs Bunny cartoon of 1951, in which Bugs Bunny is in Paris and two chefs are quarreling over who gets to cook him since (laughs) French like rabbits. And he offers a recipe for what he calls Back Bay Bayou Bunny Bordelaise as served at Antoine's. And the French chef, one of them says in a kind of cartoon French accent, "Uh, but that's Antoine's of New Orleans? And Bugs Bunny said it ain't Antoine's of Flatbush. (laughs) I remember that cartoon as a kid. So the idea that this restaurant is so well known that you don't have to explain it further. I love that. This was 1951. For us Northerners, what's the difference between Creole and Cajun cuisine? Yeah, well, I should say that the late Paul Prudhomme, a great chef, but he's got a lot to answer for because he has confused for people not from the region Creole and Cajun cuisine since his famous Cajun restaurant K. Paul's was in New Orleans. The difference is basically rural versus urban. So New Orleans has a sophisticated urban French high-end influenced food with very rich sauces with a lot of butter and wine and something that is in contrast to the rural Cajun aesthetic of uh, basically eating anything that walked across the yard. So it's the Cajuns who eat alligator more than the Creoles. It's the um, Cajuns who eat crawfish. Mm. Creoles tended to favor shrimp. Cajun food is usually a little spicier. The Cajun tradition is where you get blackened things from uh, jambalaya is a little more Cajun than it is a New Orleanian. Of all the foods you've eaten in New Orleans, what dish stands out? Well, that's a little hard. There are so many. I would say eggs sardou, which is poached eggs on artichokes with a kind of hollandaise in flecked sauce. I've had it. Unbelievable. Oyster dishes, baked oyster dishes, not just the famous oysters Rockefeller of Antoine's, but oysters with different kinds of ingredients like bacon uh, baked with crumbs. So uh, Antoine's has a dish called oysters foch. 
named after a French general of World War I fame that I love. Uh, crawfish etouffee, nothing wrong with that. Jambalaya, I'd say, is probably my very favorite dish from that region. Paul, let's move from the sublime to the pedestrian. Among the 10 restaurants you write about in your book, Howard Johnson's is the one I most associate with my youth. Summer vacations used to mean piling in the station wagon and driving to Niagara Falls or Gettysburg with really no particular plan. But mom and dad always kept an eye out for a Howard Johnson's motor in. It was a real American institution, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And I've got to say that in terms of the response I've gotten to the book so far, people I've spoken to bring up Howard Johnson's most often. Their childhood memories, just uh, like yours, even if those childhood memories don't necessarily mean, oh, I loved the fried clams or I loved their ice cream, although they often do. It's more just the experience of being a, a child at Howard Johnson's. Did Howard Johnson's invent restaurant franchising? Pretty much. That is, Howard Deering Johnson, the founder, first created a a group of places that served ice cream, and they were particularly on Cape Cod and particularly open during the summer. He had a very rich, high butterfat content ice cream that was very successful. He then created restaurants, but during the Depression, with financing hard to get, he managed to convince people in places. The first one was Orleans in uh, Cape Cod in 1935 to go in with him. That is to say, they built the structure. Uh, They financed it, but they took their supplies, their menu, their design from Howard Johnson's Central. And this model spread uh, in the 30s. You wouldn't think the best time to create a fast-growing business. But in fact, Americans continue to drive a lot for pleasure, and they wanted a fairly predictable experience on the road rather than the kind of greasy spoons or truck stops that predominated at the time. So franchising was very successful. Ironically, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Howard Deering Johnson tried to buy back a lot of the franchisees. He actually Hmm. thought franchising was an emergency measure or a necessity in certain circumstances, but he, in fact, preferred to run every aspect of the restaurant himself. You know, the only thing I remember fondly about Howard Johnson's was the ice cream. I grew up with a Neapolitan grandma running our kitchen, and to her, Hojo's was the height of blandness. She almost always made a scene when we took her there. Has the average American palate grown any more sophisticated over the years? I would say yes, in the sense that certainly Americans eat spicier cuisine. The success of chains like Chipotle or of dishes like buffalo chicken wings or black and redfish. Here we're not talking about high-end, sophisticated Mm -hmm. hipster cuisine. We're talking about things that are found all over the country. That certainly shows a greater sophistication. There's more international variety. So there are Thai restaurants throughout the country, not just on the coast. The most important indication of sophistication is the attention to the quality of basic ingredients, to whether they're fresh, whether they're seasonal, where they come from. I wouldn't say that that has taken over American dining, but that's the direction that things are going, and I think that's the biggest sign of progress in American taste. Paul, let's come back to New York, where I grew up, and Mama Leone's, which I certainly remember. To many, it was the quintessential Italian-American red sauce restaurant. How far has Italian cuisine in America evolved since those days? Mama Leone's was a kind of spectacle of red sauce restaurants. It was huge. It had waiters who joked around with you. It offered quantity, it's fair to say, rather than quality. The quantity was mind-boggling. Italian food has become much more high-end, and this is unusual because many cuisines get a kind of social image that is hard to shake. Chinese restaurants have tried to be high-end, but not with a whole lot of success. The two cuisines that have really moved into the higher social category while to some extent preserving their credibility as ethnic foods are Italian and Japanese. Mm. Some of the most expensive restaurants are Italian, and these are regional, that is to say, rather than representing Neapolitan or Southern Italian cuisine more or less, they market themselves as Tuscan or Umbrian or uh, Venetian. 
and they have very expensive ingredients like white truffles. So they emphasize game. They have a lot of different kinds of vegetables. So they have moved away from the sort of spaghetti and meatballs model that Mama Leone's so successfully represented. I've had the pleasure of traveling a bit in Italy, and I still have trouble finding an American-Italian restaurant as good as the simplest roadside restaurant you find over there. I think that gets back to your question about American cuisine. A cuisine, in a way, has to have a popular base. In other words, for cuisine really to be vibrant, ordinary people have to care about it and care about discriminating between good and bad versions or Mm. good and, and even better versions of standard dishes. And you find that in Italy. People care passionately, not because they're foodies, but because it's part of their life. And the regions really do have some long-standing traditions, not just kind of odd facts like Cincinnati four-way chili or pizza in New Haven. (laughs) Paul, let's take a last stop at Chez Panisse, which I've only been to once 25 years ago. Given its outsized influence on American taste, I mean, it's surely a story worth telling. Its founder, Alice Waters, is the quintessential self-made woman. Tell us her tale. Well, she was a self-made woman, and she was a political activist in the 1960s who then turned to gourmet food, which does not seem like an intuitive continuity. And in fact, in the early 70s, some of her former allies in left-wing causes mocked her for selling out to the bourgeoisie. But she made food and the quality of food not only a pleasure that meant that by the mid-70s, her restaurant, Chez Panisse, was among the most famous and most celebrated in the U.S., she made changing how people regarded food part of her agenda, and that meant emphasizing fresh ingredients, emphasizing the actual quality of the basic ingredients rather than how fancy a sauce you could make to disguise their not very good quality. That meant dining according to seasons, and that is the biggest influence on restaurants all over the U.S. today. It's odd that she made such a success out of it in Berkeley. Exactly, although it is when you look at the rest of Berkeley, in the 1970s, it was moving from political activism to a kind of gourmet fixation. The north side of Berkeley, where Chez Panisse to this day is located, was called the gourmet ghetto when I was a graduate student in the 70s. And some of this has to do with the end of the 1960s and its form of political activism. Some of it has to do with the fact that people in university towns actually care about food in a way that is sometimes in advance of what the rest of the population is eating or thinks is cool. Alice Waters notably took issue with Julia Child's acceptance of second-rate supermarket produce, didn't she? Yes, although Julia Child didn't think that supermarket produce was second-rate, so that's really their debate. Uh, There's a famous exchange in which Julia Child, in a TV program, uh, is irritated by Alice's insistence on the quality of ingredients and says, basically, you know, if you don't like the produce in your supermarket, tell the produce manager. I I always find that gets results. So Julia Child had many virtues and is responsible for a lot of improvements in American cooking and American taste, but the freshness and quality of ingredients is not something that she can be credited with. So I guess what came out of Che Panisse and, and Alice Waters' work is called Nouvelle Cuisine these days. Is Nouvelle Cuisine a destination or a process? Well, what's called Nouvelle Cuisine or maybe uh, New American Cuisine is both a destination and a process. It's a process because it has characterized the most desirable aspects, both commercially and aesthetically, of American dining for decades now. Where it's going, of course, if I knew, I would be able to invest in a lot of very promising things. But (laughs) certainly the quality of the ingredients, just to come back to that, is paramount. And quality means not just what they taste like, but where they come from, how they were harvested, or what kind of treatment the animals received. This is both an ethical, an environmental, but above all, a taste consideration. You know, some of the avant-garde restaurants we've been to lately have gotten into 
I would say, weird places like modern art has. Who thought it was a good idea to put foam on food? The Catalans. And in my day job as a medieval historian, I've been primarily a historian of Catalonia. So in a way, I've followed this story. Ferran Adriav El Bulli is the inventor of foam. He's the inventor of a lot of different things. His restaurant, which closed in 2011 at the height of its fame, was only open six months a year because he experimented the other six months. He was really a kind of alchemist or scientist or mad genius. And foam is only one of literally hundreds of different innovations he came up with. I find foam as incomprehensible as Jackson Pollock paintings. Yeah, but keep in mind that Jackson Pollock paintings are worth uh, tens of millions of dollars now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you never know exactly who's, uh, who's going to place a value on what commodity. Paul, when you wrap it all up, you're right that one of the main stories of world cuisine over the last 50 years is the waning of the once hegemonic influence of France. Not just cuisine, right? Well, I would say not just cuisine, so that fashion was also dominated by France. But I wouldn't say that the decline of French control over high-end dining is related exactly to some decline of political power or influence. It's really, I think, a separate issue. It's partly globalization, partly the rise of places like Japan or Italy to challenge, or Catalonia for that matter, the Basque country in Spain, to challenge the preeminence of France, and a little bit of failure of French self-confidence. Really, this system was in place for over 200 years, that is to say, French domination of international high-end cuisine. And so it was not something that was being defended actively. It was just assumed the way you use French terms for ballet. Mm -hmm. So that is a big change, and it is partly just the kind of breaking open of different options in the last 30, 40 years in everything. Paul, your book was a delight. If you ever make it up to Boston, let's go out to dinner together sometime. Thanks for coming on the show. Sounds good. Thank you. That was Paul Friedman, professor of history at Yale University and author of 10 Restaurants That Changed America, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fresa. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. To make sure you don't miss any of our shows, stop by realclearradio.org and sign up for updates. Today's program was partially underwritten by the generous support of Donors Trust, the donor-advised fund committed to promoting a free society. For more information, visit DonorsTrust.org. Ahead, Rick Wassman, founder and CEO of Copper Fox Distillery, shares the mysteries of fine craft whiskey. Stay tuned.